الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه جمعين ومن استنى بسنتي بحسان إلى يوم الدين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله وإن الأصدق الهديد كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محتتاتها وكل محتتة بدع وكل بدع ضلالة السلام عليكم Warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. On behalf of Islamic Learning Foundation, uh, we're going to continue another session from the commentary on the 40 hadith of Al-Imam Al-Nawawi, rahimahullah. And alhamdulillah, with the fadl of Allah, we have reached now hadith number 11, which is on the topic of leaving doubt. Okay. Without any further ado, let us begin the recitation of the hadith. Anabi Muhammadin al-Hasan ibn Ali bin Abi Talib سب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وريحانته قال حفظت من رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم دع ما يريبك إلى ما لا يريبك رواه الترمذي ونسائي وقال الترمذي حديث حسن صحيح Translation On the authority of Abu Muhammad Al-Hasan bin Ali bin Abi Talib the grandson of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and who is dearest to him, who said, I have committed to memory, I have memorized from the Messenger of Allah the following, leave that about which you are in doubt for that which you are in no doubt. And this is narrated by Imam Tirmidhi and also Imam An-Nisai and Tirmidhi said that it is a sound and authentic hadith. Okay. So as is our tradition, we're going to now go to the life of the narrator of this beautiful hadith. And this is none other than the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib al-Hasan. In this hadith is mentioned, وَرَيْحَانَتِي The one who is dearest to the Prophet ﷺ. And indeed, there was a great connection and love by the Prophet ﷺ to his two grandsons, Hassan and Hussein. Okay. He... Hassan was born in the third year of Hijrah and the Prophet ﷺ passed away when he was approximately seven years old only. And Ali uh, came to the Prophet ﷺ okay, and he showed him this beautiful baby and then the Prophet ﷺ asked him, what did you name him? And then Ali said, Harb, war. And the Prophet ﷺ said, no, he is not Harb, but he is Hassan, which is beautiful, which is excellent. And he, subhanAllah, Hassan looked just like the Prophet wasallam, and indeed he was very loved by him, where he said, oh Allah, I love this person, and I want you to love him as well as anyone who loves him. Okay. And Jabir saw that both Hassan and Hussein were riding the back of the Prophet Sallallahu So imagine these two beautiful children. They're riding on the Messenger of Allah. Sayyidul Mursaleen. SubhanAllah. This is the love and connection of the two grandsons of the Prophet Sallallahu And Prophet Sallallahu named Hassan and also Hussein. He named them Sayyid, like masters. And he said that both Hassan and Hussein will be the leaders of the youth of paradise. And there's also a narration which states that they... Ya'ni Hassan and Hussein are my two sweet smelling flowers in this world. This is Nari in Sahih Bukhari. He is the leader of the youth of Jannah along with his brothers. He and Hassan, he Anhuma, had many students. And he was also known to be exceptionally generous. For, for example, travelers who would go to come to Medina, he would actually look out for them and give them. Uh, a pricey and very generous gift as well. And so Hassan was a, actually a leader of the people. After Ali Radhaan passed away, Hassan took his position, yani the position of Khalifa. And unfortunately, there was a lot of political issues and strife. The Prophet said that there would be a day 
which would come where Hassan would actually bring a truce between two armies. Indeed, he was appointed as a Khalifa for only six months, and this was opposite Muawiyah Rada'an. And he, to preserve the peace, as the Prophet predicted, he stepped down to avoid the bloodshed and the strife between the Muslim community. And it is also said that he was unfortunately poisoned and thus he attained the status of a martyr, a shaheed among the other glad tidings that the Prophet ﷺ ascribed to him and also his brother Hussein. So with this, we're inshallah going to transition to the actual hadith. And it's very short, it's very beautiful, it's very potent inshallah. And bi'idhnillah will get a lot of important benefits from this short hadith. So, this hadith goes in line with hadith number 6, which discusses the doubtful matters. In this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ has set a criteria by which Muslims can decide whether something is permissible or not. The hadith quoted by Imam Nawi rahimullah, is actually an abridged version of a hadith found in Jamiat Tirmidhi, where the Prophet ﷺ elaborates by further saying, فَإِنَّ صِدْقَ تُمَعْنِينَةٌ وَإِنَّ الْكَذِبَ riba." So here the Prophet ﷺ said, Verily, truth is tranquility. Tuma'nina. And falsehood, kadib, is riba, doubt. It comes from raib. Like, dalika kitab la raib. There's no doubt. So here, falsehood is ascribed as connected with doubt. So here the Prophet ﷺ is setting a criteria which allows us to discern between that which is right and wrong. That which is right is something which we are sure about in terms of correctness. We have confidence that it is correct because we are at peace with it. This is opposed to that which is wrong, which causes us to waver and to have doubt regarding it. So this means that the truth will lead to tranquility and the falsehood leads to doubt. So in terms of lessons, we see that the heart is a criteria for discerning the doubtful. The heart of a true believer is tranquil at the sight of truth and righteousness, while at the sight of falsehood and wrongfulness and kadib, the believer's heart becomes unsure and shaky and wavers. So if a believer, if, if he finds or she finds that his heart has doubt in something or uncertainty in a matter, then this is a sign that he should stay away from it, that she should stay away from it. So this is a criteria for us. For well, the perception of the heart regarding doubt only applies to the righteous Muslim who is enlightened through the guidance of the Quran and Sunnah. So this consists of three prerequisites. Ya'ni, that proper heart. The prerequisites for this is number one, ilm or knowledge. Then you have iman. Okay. And then you have three, the adherence and following the wahi the divine revelations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this only exists for the person adhering to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yani that sensation that the heart gives when it interacts with the truth and also when it interacts with the kadhib or the falsehood. Okay. And only at this level the person can use their heart as a guide. So not every person can use their heart to discern between the true and the false matters. It's only for the mu'min because it's something which is a fitra and is developed to that ultimate degree where it becomes a criteria for him or her to be guided. Okay. Well, this hadith lays down a principle that can be applied in all aspects of one's life actually. And it also shows us a way to truth and righteousness. Hence, this hadith is of extreme importance. And this criteria does not work for a Muslim as we just mentioned, who indulges in the muharramat, the forbidden acts to which his heart is not sensitive to. So even if the heart were to be used as a criteria to judge between right and wrong, it would not be reliable in this case, since the heart has been corrupted by the sins of that individual. So if something is clearly permissible in the sharia, there is no point in refraining from thinking that it is an ibadah. Going forward, Okay, principle of fiqh in terms of certainty taking precedence in doubtful matters. Okay. So if there's a situation, if there are conflicting opinions in a particular doubtful matter, then the thing which is known to be certain takes precedence. 
This is actually one of the main principles of fiqh. Examples. Okay. So, if we are certain that a piece of cloth has some najasa or impurity on it, but we are not sure as to where it is, then the whole cloth should be washed because we are certain that that cloth has some najasa on it. On the other hand, if there is doubt regarding a clean cloth having an impurity without any obvious signs of impurity, then there is no reason to wash the cloth. Okay, so here we already have a certainty. We have a certainty which overweighs and overshadows and overpowers the doubt. Okay, so this is because the cloth was known to be clean. Another example on doubtful matters is in the salah. If you are unsure of the number of raka completed, then in such a situation our prayer should be based on the number of raka which we are more certain of. Okay. And if you are sure that we have prayed one raka, then we should continue by performing a second raka. Okay. Another common instance where a Muslim may be uncertain of something is, of course, in the state of wudu, before the salah. And this case, of course, goes back to that which is certain. Okay, so if you are asked we're in a state of wudu, but we're unsure of whether their wudu was nullified, then they should go back to that which they were certain of, that they had wudu. Okay. On the other hand, if they were in a state where they were not in wudu, and are unsure if they did wudu, then they should assume that they do not have wudu, because that was the certainty that, that they did not have wudu before this perception or thinking that they may have made wudu. I just... Anecdotally, just going back and sidetracking, it, was, it just reminds me of an incident when I was in the MSA and we were, me and the brothers, we were doing uh, jama'ah and um, I, I believe I was leading and uh, there was two brothers behind me and then one after another found out they didn't have wudu and just left the salah and then another person left and then uh, guess who was left? Me. I found out that I didn't have wudu either. So it was a very... Uh, extremely funny, but it was an unfortunate incident where all three of us did not even have wudu. And this is how the shaitan tests us. Where we should be sure of our wudu, for example, right, before we enter the state of salah. This is a nice criteria to have before shaitan makes a second guess and tries to distract us from the salah to the point where we don't even know if we have wudu or not. And now we're going to look at some contemporary doubtful matters. Okay. So one of the tricks of shaitan Aside from this whole thing about wudu or not, right? Trying to doubt what's going on in your salah. That's why we have to try to be as focused as possible so that shaitan does not get into our heads and distracts us from the, the best uh, worship we could do during the day, which is the salah. So, one of the tricks of the shaitan is by making that which is forbidden to appear as if it is permissible. And one should always be aware not to be deceived by Iblis al rajim the cursed. If something is haram, then it will always be forbidden. Okay, we must never allow the shaitan to influence us and change our perception into thinking as something which is haram or forbidden may not be all that bad and can be indulgent, you know, or we can go close to it. For example, in today's society, riba or usury is widespread and considered okay and acceptable despite the fact that it is clearly 100% haram. But this is one area in which many Muslims are confused as to whether something is allowable or otherwise because of the rampantness of this haram thing. May Allah protect us from riba and allow us to have pure wealth and also put pure morsels into our body to nourish us insha'Allah. So there are many fiqhi rulings regarding modern matters which are not known to the Muslim public at large. And you know, we talked about this in hadith number 6 as well. So we need to keep ourselves informed about the latest views and opinions of the scholars on these new matters. For example, it could be in the realm of banking or insurance or finance. Okay. So despite this, new media such as YouTube and transcription of Islamic knowledge also on the internet is allowing for the public to have better access to contemporary Islamic viewpoints. So we need to keep ourselves informed with the latest views and opinions of the ulama or the scholars, not just, you know, Shay Google. Okay. But Specifically on the matters which relate to our modern lifestyle, you know, in not that we should make our lifestyle modern, but in this new age, we need to obviously do what we need to do as Muslims, and the haq doesn't change, the faraid do not change despite 
the changing of times. Okay? And specifically, as the sheikh of this book, the author of this book, mentioned specifically in the realm of banking, insurance, and finance, because there may be doubtful matters regarding those new things. So there are many matters that are intrinsically neither good or bad. However, within a certain context or scenario, they can be good or bad. So the application of the cautious approach will suggest that we should weigh the benefits and also the harm caused by such things. So following the principles will lead us to the conclusion that it is permissible to give up a minor benefit for the purpose of avoiding a major harm. Okay. It is also permissible to tolerate a minor harm for the purpose of avoiding a major harm or for the purpose of gaining a major benefit. So these are important principles we extract from these hikam and these wisdoms from the Arba'in. So going forward, in terms of reconciling different opinions within the Sharia. Well, there are many matters relating to the Sharia, uh, Islamic law, where scholars hold conflicting views or opinions. For example, some scholars say that it is wajib to recite the Fatiha in the congregational prayer, in the Salah, right? While other scholars state that listening to the Imam's recitation of the Fatiha suffices. Another example is in the paying of the zakah for women's jewelry. Whether a woman has to pay zakah for jewelry that she uses personally, that is not used in investment, versus that which is used. But well, this is another fake issue which has opposing rulings. Okay. But these can go back to a classical opinion based on a madhab, or may also need its ijtihad from a faqih, if it is regarding a new opinion. Okay. So the traditional approach of a uh, faqih in ruling on a matter is based on that of a particular madhab, if present. However, it is also important to note that despite many matters in Sharia, which have ikhtilaf, most have one unified ruling. So that's very important. Despite our differences, do not let that throw you off in saying that or having the uh, premonition or thought that Islam is, you know, there's so many different opinions out there. No. Most of the opinions, they're unified. But there are ikhtilaf on only a few issues in our deen. So that's very important in terms of the realm of fiqh. Okay. So, one important principle in the Sharia is that ijtihad is also not allowed for a matter that's clearly and definitely has been elucidated from the Quran and the authentic ahadith of the Prophet So, the prominent madhabs like the Hanafi, the Shafi, the Maliki, the Hanbali madahib, along with the Ahl Hadith or the Salafi madhab, all go back to the students of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sahaba. Okay. Well, it's very important to remember that despite having a difference of opinion, you come across a difference of opinion from the other madahib. It's very important. Okay. So do not consider, do not consider yourself or oneself to be higher over another Muslim because of the madhab that you belong to or one belongs to. This is a vehicle for division. And you know the shaitan loves division. And so do his friends. Okay. So with the madhabs of the madahib, we need to have an academic approach and not an emotional approach. Choosing a madhab is a personal matter. You may want to follow the madhab of your family or parents. It's a personal issue. Okay. It doesn't make you better than the average other Muslims around you. Okay. It's a personal choice and do what you feel comfortable with. For the lay person, perhaps, it is better to stick to one madhab for ease. But you need to also be in contact with a trusted scholar or alim to learn and be under them and ask questions relative to that school of thought. Okay. And at the end of the day, okay, these, these issues become trivial among the more important issues of the ummah. Because at the end of the day, we're there praying salah together as one ummah, as ibadullah, inshallah. We're not going to be questioned about the madahib that's not one of the questions that the angel will ask us when we reach to our final destination. Okay. So, some scholars believe in complete adherence. However, it is important, and with all due respect, this appears to be the weaker opinion because you may find occasional rulings in a respective madhab which are weaker than another opinion. You're comparing this basically, apples and oranges, but sometimes one of the fruit may be more ripe and more strong and more sahih than the other. As long as there is some 
validity to that, inshallah, at the end of the day, it's okay. But just know that there's no one mother which has all the strong opinions. Well, other scholars say it is okay to go outside a mother if a particular ruling has more authority. And again, this is not just a simple task. It requires research, contemplation, tafakkur about what to do because you are choosing this for your deen. So, for example, you know, if you're a Hanafi, is it haram for you to say the Amin out loud? Of course not. Of course not. This is a, a very strong hadith in Sahih Bukhari. And if you choose to do that, alhamdulillah. If you don't, alhamdulillah. It's not going to invalidate your salah. But again, these are personal issues and personal choices that we have to do and make. But again, not be tools of division between us because that is something which the shaitan loves to find. So the important thing is that a choice in adhering to an opinion cannot be based on one's desire, but to desire that which is ultimately the best opinion. And that's very important. So we can't just pick and choose based on what our desires. Okay. But remember also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرُ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also wants for us ease and does not want for us a difficulty. And this is also a nice fiqhi principle as well. But we have to choose what is right. After contemplating and seeing what the scars say, you make that choice. Okay? And it's okay also to, again, just stick to your mother as well, no doubt. And that's the easier road. And perhaps for many, the lay people who do not have that appropriate knowledge, to do that is perhaps best to stick to one mother for ease. And Allah knows best. Allahu A'lam. Okay? Don't want to go into a controversial topic and a tangent from going and deterring from this the shot of this beautiful hadith, but this is an important, I think, tangent relative to this discussion also. So yet another approach of the scholars regarding the sharia and the fiqhi viewpoints is on the matter of authenticity and the soundness of the evidences. So their viewpoint prefers, often another approach is that the viewpoint prefers the strongest evidence based on the Quran and Sunnah. So that's one approach. Like for example, Ahli Hadith or the Salafi Madhah, that's basically their stance in terms of looking at various issues in our deen. So, it is a paramount principle not to fight and cause discord over different viewpoints which have evidence based on the Qur'an and Sunnah. Again, we mentioned that the Madhab, Madahib all go towards the Sahaba, which were the students of the Prophet ﷺ. They had also their own different opinions and different preferences, and also we have to respect that as well, because they go back to ultimately the Prophet ﷺ as well. So sometimes it is better to let go of a certain fiqhi principle or opinion to promote unity. Okay. This is important also. Remember, this is not carved in stone. You know, fiqh is an application of sharia depending on your situation and what's going on. And you can be a situation on an island where you have no food whatsoever and you may be forced to eat something which normally would be haram. Okay. So everyone's situation is different. Like for example, you may be in a situation where determining, for example, our Eid for a certain Muslim country or state. Okay. You may have an opinion, whether it's local, whether it's global moon sighting, or whether it's calculations. You may have already had defined viewpoint that you follow. However, to avoid debate on that topic, to prevent disunity, even though your opinion may be stronger. So if, for example, the whole community you know, the whole community is making Eid on one day. And this is nothing which is haram based on the sunnah opinion. And your opinion goes against it. What's the better thing to do? Is to make Eid on when, you, when, when you think is best? Promote unity and not go against the jama' to go because it's also not haram. It's in, in line with the Quran and sunnah to go and with that other opinion Put your opinion aside for the greater good of the Ummah. And this is sometimes, again, what we have to do also as Muslims, Ibadullah, for the greater good. And this is also where these hadiths, uh, a hadith, give us you know, these uh, gems in terms of guidance, what to do on these matters. So, in conclusion, highlights from this hadith, doubtful matters come up frequently in the lives of all people, be it big or small. Thus, the practicality of this hadith, of a few words, is immense. Okay. And this hadith equips us also with a practical and simple criteria by which we can judge doubtful actions and situations. 
We as Muslims also need to understand how to apply a criteria correctly and not to be deceived by wrong perceptions or personal interests or desire. Okay. It's also important as we look at this hadith to purify our hearts so that it may guide us in these doubtful matters. Remember, the heart wavers when it sees falsehood and the heart has iqminan when there is truth. So we should also have the proper and mature perspective regarding fiqh opinions of different madhahib because we are here being enlightened by the hadith. We have to also enlighten other people all around us as well and our communities as well and be aware of the greater goals of Islam. And we should of course also as we go forward in time, in the future where there's new issues going on, we should be aware of scholarly opinions on new matters important to the deen. Okay. So these are some questions to inshallah also contemplate as we close this hadith. Jazakullah khairan for your attendance. May Allah give us tawfiq from the wisdoms of this great hadith and also from the previous hadith inshallah as well. May Allah allow us also to go to the end and be able to also go to the end of um, hadith number 42 inshallah in this great collection. Subhanaka Allahumma hamdik wa nashhadu wa la ila illa anta wa sakhlaka wa tubu wa ilayka assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.